This is Anatomy and Physiology 1, Chapter 1, Body Organization. Anatomy can be split into, divided into two main categories, gross anatomy or macroscopic anatomy, and the second is microscopic anatomy. And it's really quite simple. Gross anatomy is the anatomy that we can see with the naked eye. For example, looking at the heart, the, just the heart as a whole, uh, studying the heart structures, that's all macroscopic anatomy. Gross anatomy. The heart has four chambers. We can see those four chambers without any help of a microscope. We can see them with the naked eye. You can see the valves of the heart with the naked eye. <laughs> We can see the major blood vessels going to and from the heart with the naked eye. That's all macroscopic or gross anatomy. Microscopic anatomy is studying the structures that cannot be seen with the naked eye, with just the naked eye, um, and that need the, the, the microscope. So going into the cellular level now, um, uh, uh, um, we're talking microscopic anatomy, looking at the cardiac muscle cells. That is microscopic anatomy. <clears throat> if you want to look at connective tissue at the cellular level, that's microscopic anatomy. If you want to look at the adipose tissue at the cellular level, single fat cells going around the heart, that's microscopic anatomy. We need a microscope in, able, in, in, in order to see those single cells. And the other side of the course is the physiology part. The physiology is the study of the function. How do we take that anatomy that we just got done learning and put, them, put it together? How does that anatomy work together to help a, a particular function? That is the physiology. So we mentioned the four, the four chambers of the heart. The physiology then is seeing how, understanding how those four chambers work together. Understanding how the four valves of the heart working, uh, work, how do they work together? That's the physiology part. The anatomy is looking at the individual anatomical structures, heart uh, chamber one, chamber two, and so on. And the physiology is seeing how they work together. Uh, another example is, uh, um, an easy example is looking at the, the, the arm, the bones of the arm. We have the humerus up at the top, and we have the radius and the ulna. These are th uh, three anatomical terms, humerus, radius, and ulna. The physiology then would, 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 is concerned with, well, how do those three bones articulate? How do they connect together to allow our arm, our elbow, to flex or to rotate or to extend. That's studying the physiology of those three bones. <clears throat> the next part that you need to be familiar with are the levels of organization. And we have five, six levels of organization. And if we start with the smallest level of organization, that's the anatomic or uh, chemical, you know, it, there, there's different, you can, you can divide it even into more than six, but uh, the chemical level, well, you, you take, you take atoms and you combine them and you got yourself a molecule or a chemical and you continue to do that Put them, put those together, and you get, and you pretty soon you got yourself at the cellular level. Now um, there are 
there are several different kinds of cells. There we have our cells. Here's just a few examples. Smooth muscle cells. We also have cardiac muscle cells. We also have skeletal muscle cell. But we have blood cells. We have bone cells. We have fat cells, nerve cells, reproductive cells, epithelial cells. And you put these and, and, and if you can, if you put these, if you have two or more different kinds of these kind of cells, we're, we found ourselves up in the next level, which is the tissue level. In order to be studying the tissue level, we have to have two or more different kinds of cells. And if we move up to the organ level, in order to be at the organ level, you, you need to have two or more different kinds of tissues. And then to make it up to the organ system level, you need to, you need to be talking about two or more different types of organs. And then finally, the organism at the very, very top all organisms have two or more, at least two or more different kinds of organ systems. So uh, going back to the heart, for example, um, at the cellular level, <clears throat> the heart has um, cardiac muscle and it has connective uh, tissue and it has um, uh, connective tissue cells, and it has um, adipose cells, adipocytes, and it has neural cells, neurons, and so these are different kinds of cells. You put them together, and we have our cells, uh, we, we have muscle tissue, we have adipose tissue, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and those make up the, the organ as a whole, the heart. And if we continue to the organ system level, well, an example of the organ system level is the cardiovascular system. Cardio, heart, vascular, meaning the blood vessels, and the, the, that system is made up of two or more organs, cardiovascular system. And then, of course, at the very, very top, the organismal level, the organism has several organ systems. We have uh, the muscular system. We have the skeletal system. We have the nervous system. We have the epithelial. We have the... Uh, reproductive system, lymphatic system, endocrine system, and so on. <clears throat> so it's important for you to be able to recognize um, examples of organs or tissues or organ systems and be able to know that, hey, this is, a, this is an organ or this is a tissue or this is a cell or this is an organ system or be able to produce. So which of the following is an organ? So forward or backward, um, get, get good at recognizing uh, the, different, the, the different levels. There are four primary tissue types in all of the body Everything that makes up the body is made up of four primary tissue types, no matter where you are in the body. Skin, or muscle, or blood, or tendons, you name it, it's going to be made out of, up of either epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, or nervous, neural tissue. And we'll be delving into each of these uh, later, later on in later chapters. And, and so as we sort of just touch 
the 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 summaries of these uh, we're we're in no way done you know, studying these different tissue types. We'll be doing that in 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 detail. So of course know these four. There there know these four for this uh, for this chapter. <clears throat> and this is a nice diagram to show you uh, where again uh, does do do tissues fit in? Tissues are made up of two or more different kinds of cells, yet two or more different kinds of tissues make up, can, can combine to make up an organ. And there's your epithelial, your, your CT, your muscle, and your neural tissue. Very briefly now, very, very briefly, just know the, the basics of the four different, the four primary tissue types. Just the basics. Epithelial in general um, <clears throat> has a few functions a few main functions. Number one, it, it forms, it can form a barrier with specific properties. It covers exposed body surfaces, exposed to the outside, and it, ex and it also lines the inside of our body. Cavities and, um, and organs, this is also epithelial tissue. So anything that's, uh, that, that lines Chances are it's we're talking epithelial tissue. <clears throat> Our skin, for example, is epithelial tissue. But also on the inside, anything that our digestive tract needs all that is all that lining is epithelia. Respiratory, reproductive lining, urinary tracts, this is all epithelial tissue that that, that makes these different linings. And, but the, uh, but there is another type of, of uh, a, a subcategory of epithelial, epithelial tissue, which is um, epithelia, and this produces glandular secretions. The gl glands, glands are made up of epithelia. So another, another um, function of epithelial tissue. <clears throat> Connective tissue is by far the most diverse of all the different muscle, uh, all the different tissue types. <clears throat> muscle, for example, there are three different types of muscle. We have cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, and smooth muscle. Epithelia, there were just, just, just basically two kinds, the stuff that lines and the stuff that makes glands. Just two. Um, nervous is very, very, pretty straightforward. But connective tissue can be tough in the sense that it's very, very broad. Bone, bone is is a type of connective tissue. Cartilage is a type of connective tissue. Ligaments, tendons, adipose tissue is a type of connective tissue. Adipose is, is fat. Blood, all the stuff inside of blood, is connective tissue. <clears throat> and so you see how it can kind of get confusing because bone is, 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 is for structure and protection, ligaments and tendons. <clears throat> and so the, the, and so connective tissue, um, has so many different functions, binding and supporting, protecting and insulating and fuel storage, uh, transportation of, of, of oxygen and, and, car and carbon dioxide. So um, this one, when we get to it, um, we'll see that you, you, you really got to slow down because there's just all kinds of different types of tissues within the connective tissue. And here's just a, um, an example of, of um, a type of connective tissue. Muscle. So, so uh, again, just the brief, just in, just very briefly for this chapter, just very brief, briefly know the, these few bullet points, and then later on we're going to delve into each of them in in detail. 
muscle, the major functions is skeletal movement, bone movement. It, it, it's what allows bones to move, to, to, to flex and to, uh, jo joints to flex and to extend, for example. Soft tissue support. In, within our viscera, maintenance of blood flow, <coughs> movement of materials internally, the GI tract. How does the how does our small intestine move food? Well, that's that's muscle. How does our body maintain a ninety eight point six degrees? Is it uh, you know blankets or whatever? No, it's 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 skeletal muscle. It's actually muscle that allows us to stay at 98.6 degrees. <clears throat> and then we have three types, like, he, like we sort of mentioned before. We have skeletal muscle. That's what we see on the outside of our bodies. The, mu the muscle that's attached to our bones is that skeletal muscle, which is why it's called skeletal, because it's attached to our skeleton. It's attached to our bone, so we call it skeletal muscle. And then of course, right in the, the, the heart is made up of cardiac muscle. The function propels blood through the through the blood vessels. That's what the heart does, does nothing else except is a pump to pump blood around in, in the in the in humans. And um, and then smooth muscle is not cardiac, is not skeletal, it's, it's, it's smooth. This, this muscle is, uh, it takes care of all of the viscera, all of the organs inside of the body now. It, uh, um, it allows food to, to it, it propels food through the, it, it, uh, through the body. It, it uh, helps push urine out of the body. It, it helps um, us speak when we talk. It constricts blood vessels. It di helps dilate blood vessels. All these different things, um, we're talking smooth muscle. And those are the three different. Of course, again, we're going we're gonna to delve into this later, but this is all you really need to know for, uh, for, for this particular handout. And here's an example of the three different types. Yes, yeah, skeletal muscle up at the top there. And you notice the perpendicular lines going up and down. Those are bands. That's that's called striations. So skeletal muscle is striated, and it's also multinucleated because they 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 were single cells and they fused together, which is why it ends up looking like that. And then that's cardiac muscle in the middle, and it's also striated, but a main difference is that there are uh, branches. Instead of it, instead of the muscle like in skeletal muscle, the muscles are uh, muscle fibers are parallel, stacked nicely. Well, with cardiac, it's uh, the muscles are connected to each other, and that way, since all the muscle cells in the heart are connected to each other, the heart can communicate very easily and pump and beat at the at the same exact time. Easy communication, and then finally, smooth muscle is at the bottom there. That's the muscle that you find within glands and the respiratory system and the circulatory system and so on. Our viscera. Smooth muscle does not have those striations, that sort of zebra print going up and down or perpendicular to the fibers. It's, it doesn't have that. It still does contract just like the other two. It just, it's just missing the, that zebra print looking um, striations. And that's, that's all you have to know for a muscle for this chapter. <coughs> Nervous tissue is specialized to carry information or instructions within the body. Extremely fast, uh, fast communication, 
and there are two basic types of cells. We have neurons, which are really, really long, which can be very, very long, uh, you know, up to two feet or more. And then we have neuroglia, which are s um, several different kinds of cells. And those two are the two different, two basic types of cells, neurons and neuroglia. And they're found in the CNS and in the PNS, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Here we see the neurons, which are the large um, blue. Those are the bodies, the cell, just the, just the body of the cell. And then the neuroglia are those other smaller um, body structures connecting to the neurons, and those are neuro neuroglia, and those have all kinds of other functions. <clears throat> now, the next piece we're, we're, um, we're looking at um, feedback systems. Feedback systems. We have positive feedback systems and we have negative feedback systems. But in each of them, uh, we have, as you see over in um, number one there, we have a receptor, we have a control center, and we have an effector. And in these feedback systems, the receptor, for example, let's let's talk about thermo regulation, uh, temp, which is basically temperature regulation. The, the, the receptor then would be nerve endings in our skin, found in our skin, sensing the temperature of, 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 the, of the skin on the outside of our body. Well, let's say, um, let's say, uh, uh, it, it's, you know, it, it wants to be 98.6 or just, or, or just around there. A little bit cool might be fine. Well, let's say the temperature drops dramatically and it, it goes to, you know, uh, you know, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, those receptors then, those nerve endings are going to send a, send a signal all the way up the arms, all the way up the legs, all the way up to the, all the way up to the brain, which is the control center. And the control center then um, will say, ah, it's much too cold, at, at least out on the, on the outside surface of the body, and therefore it sends a signal back all the way to the effector. Well, what, what, is the, what does the effector do? The effector... <clears throat> changes the condition at the original spot that the receptor was taking in information. And um, so here it, it, it responds to commands opposing the original stimulus. So the effector in this example would be, uh, uh, for example, um, Erect, er, erector pili muscles in the skin. These erecti, erector pili muscles, when they contract, they're really, really tiny little structure, little tiny little smooth muscles in the skin. When they pull, they pull ha our hairs, our hair follicles, they pull them perpendicular to the skin. They, in other words, they, they make your hairs stand up. And, you know, everyone's seen that you get and you get a goosebump the goosebump is actually each of those goosebumps is actually the erector pili contracting and it shortens when it short when that muscle shortens to contract when it pulls it kind of has this little fat belly and that little fat belly is the is the result of 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 what you see on the outside of the of the skin that little bump is actually right where you have in the little erector pili pulling a hair perpendicular to the, to the skin, standing those hairs up that way, uh, you can slow down the air that's swirling around right on the outside of your skin. 
slowing it down. That way you can, it sort of acts as an insulating blanket. So the erector pili is the effector. What is it trying to do? It's trying to negate what is happening on the outside. It's trying to bring the set, bring the, 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 um, the environment back to the set point, the original set point, which is, let's say, 98 degrees. And, and there, and, and so there you have it. And, and then once, once, once it's done that long enough, hopefully it reaches homeostasis and, uh, and, and, and you've completed the, 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 the cycle. So, um, and, and here's, and here's a, um, here's an example, um, another example of thermal regulation where um, you have where you have uh, uh, you know 22 degrees Celsius and um, when the uh, when the temperature uh, rises above that the air conditioner then will turn on and it continues to to stay on until the that red line goes back down, 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 down. Once it's it's down far enough, the air conditioner can then, okay, if we're cold enough, the air conditioner can turn off, and then the temperature will eventually go back up. And so that middle line there is called the set point. So our bodies are always trying to keep keep um, those feedback systems at that set point. Okay, so we have two different types of feedback systems. We have negative feedback systems, and we have positive feedback systems. With negative feedback systems, the, the negative feedback systems try to bring the body back to the set point. When when the body deviates away from the set point, the negative feedback system negates this and brings it back. No, 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 you're getting too hot. Let's, let's pull it back down, get it cool it down. If the body gets too cool, no, 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 you're, we're getting too cool. We negate this. It's moving away, 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 diverging, getting away, deviates away from the set point. The body then no, nope, we're we're way too cold. Let's pull it. Let's bring it. Bring the temperature back up. This is negative feed. This is an example of negative negative feedback system, and <clears throat> the negative feedback systems that are in place in the body are regulating and working all the time, all the time, constantly working, constantly working, constantly working, keeping our body at homeostasis. It minimizes the change. You can say when it, when when the body starts to deviate away from the set point, the negative feedback system tries to minimize this change and bring it back. That's why it's called negative. Now the regul now the uh, thermal regulating um, feedback system that we just talked about, thermal regulation. This is an example of negative feedback. You get too hot, no problem. We'll make sweat sweat drops. And the sweat holds heat, and when the sweat um, evaporates, the heat goes away along with the sweat, and we cool down. When it gets too cold, we'll stand those hairs up, or we'll shiver, for example. And so this is these are uh, examples of negative, where, where our bodies are constantly, constantly, constantly working. These feedback systems are constantly working. This is negative. Now... <laughs> Positive feedback systems, they have the same um, main parts, the receptor, control center, and effectors, except in a positive feedback system, when the body begins to deviate away from the set point, a positive feedback system will make it continue in the same direction, which is why it's called positive. It continues in the same, deviates further away from um, the feedback system. For example, um, when you have when you have it, when you get a cut, 
<clears throat> it's not a negative feedback system that comes into play. It's a it's a positive feedback system. And so uh, for so you know when you have damage to the cells in the in a in a blood vessel wall, it releases a chemical that begins the process uh, the process of blood clotting. Blood clotting um, factors, platelets, and so on, will rush to the rush to the rescue, and they will begin to, um, and they'll begin to uh, accumulate in the the area of damage. Well, well, those platelets and so on cause um, cause chemicals send chemicals out to go and get some more and go and get some more and so more more platelets and so on will come and and come to the rescue and those even will send even more chemicals out and so what you get is is a positive feedback loop it it accelerates the original uh response instead of going backwards it goes forward now, what's the end result? Well, yes, of course, the end result, eventually there's going to be a, a stop. But if you look at just those few, uh, uh, those few steps, it's actually moving in the forward direction, not, in, not going backwards. Another example um, is, is, is uh, uh, parturition, is um, uh, when, when a mother is in labor when when it's time the baby pushes begins to push its head up against the cervix of of the mom and this causes a signal to rush up to the brain and the brain then releases oxytocin and and um and uh, uh, hormones that and those hormones when they finally reach the uterus in a if it was negative feedback system the uterus would say oh nope nope don't you know let's 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 loosen up here so that way we don't want to squeeze on the baby because then the baby is is going to continue to push on the cervix so let's loosen that up no actually what is what that that would be a negative but what happens? Those hormones cause the uterus to, to, to actually contract, pushing the baby even harder on the, on the cervix. In, it's actually going in the forward direction. So the original, the original stimulus is actually accelerated and, going fa and, and is forced to go even faster. And you, so you see how this is a positive. And so, well, what, what happens? The baby pushes even harder. And this sends a signal up to the brain. The brain sends a signal back down and causes the, the uterus to push. Continue, 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 continue. Continue to contract and push even harder. And ow, ow, ow. And it, and it does it again. And it does it again. Signal goes up. Hormones come down, cause once they reach the, 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 the uterus, the uterus contracts, pushing the baby. Well, to what end? When is it going to stop? Well, it stops when the baby comes out. So yes, of course, there's always an end result, but the original stimulus, which was the baby pushing its head up against the cervix, actually increases and increases and increases and increases, not decreasing, until, of course, the baby comes out. But in the meantime, that cycle that we see over and over and over, that's actually positive feedback. So there's another example of a positive feedback loop. Another example is a, a, a lactation. This is another example. These are, are rare. Positive feedback loops are rare, generally are, and aren't co continuously occurring in all people. Negative feedback loops are occurring continuously all the time. The next, the next part is... Um, anatomical positions and regions and so on. First of all, it's important to understand that anato what anatomical position is. Anatomical position is when you are standing straight up, feet forward, hand, your palms supine or your palms facing forward, and you're, you're standing up straight. 
This is anatomical position. Why is it important that your palms are facing forward? Why not just kind of like relax at your side? Well, you have two bones, uh, uh, two, two bones in your lower arm. And the radius is, um, is lateral and the ulna is medial from top to bottom. Well, when you relax, those two bones end up crossing towards your wrist. They end up crossing. So now instead of the radius, the radius is still lateral up at the top, up by your elbow, but it actually ends up being medial at down by your wrist because you've crossed those two bones over when you turn your palms from being supine to prone, from being palms being forward to, to, uh, to backward or anterior to posterior. So um, that's anatomical position. And um, and so here's a couple of uh, uh, terms. Supine means facing up, like if you're laying on your back, you are supine, you're facing up. And if you're laying on your tummy, you are prone. Soup, also if your hands are forward or like, you know, let's say you make your hands so that they're uh, sort of making a, a, a cup of soup sort of thing, you know, you're, it's that's how you can kind of remember supine, like, hey, can I have some soup poured into my hands? That's supine. So your palms are facing forward. Um, we need to memorize the terminology for the four abdominal pelvic quadrants and the nine abdominal pelvic regions. Okay. I'm not going to expect you to know which organs are in which quadrant and which organs are in which um, of the nine uh, abdominal pelvic regions. I'm not going to expect you to know that the liver is here and the spleen is here, but I will expect you to, to uh, regurgitate the, the regions. So you got the left upper quadrant, the right upper quadrant, for the, for example, or the epigastric region, the umbilical region, the right inguinal region, I expect you to just know where those are. So if I were to put an X on a picture, for example, uh, that you can just recognize those. Um, and so we're almost done. So um, I want you to understand uh, superior is up inferior is below. You can also say um, um, cephalic is means towards the head. And we say when we there's a, a, a blood vessel that you will learn next semester. Break the, the brachiocephalic it just means that that blood vessel will send blood to the brach brachia, which is your arm, or cephalic towards the head, it sends, it's, it branches. Also, uh, lateral and medial, proximal and distal, and anterior and posterior. So, <clears throat> when we say uh, superior, superior and inferior, we're usually talking about like in the trunk of the body or like in the head. For example, your nose is superior to, what do you think? The mouth. Just an example. The, the nose is superior to the mouth because your nose is, is above your mouth when you're in anatomical position. Uh, and your chin is inferior to the mouth. Your chin is below your mouth when you're in anatomical position, not when you're doing a headstand or whatever. Um, when we use the terms proximal and distal, we're usually talking about the arms and legs. Now, would you say that the elbow is superior to the wrist? Yeah, the elbow is superior to the wrist. But a better way to say it is the elbow is proximal to the wrist. The elbow is closer, is proximal, is closer uh, to your shoulder or closer to the midline than the wrist is. And the wrist 
is further down your arm, so we say distal. It's distal to your elbow. Your shoulder is proximal to your elbow, and your fingers are distal to your elbow. Okay, so you see those how you, how we can use those examples when we say proximal and distal we're talk we're usually t describing points on the arm or on, on the on the leg <laughs> <clears throat> and and then finally uh, our um, two more two more different uh, sets we have lateral and medial um, and just try to give you some easy points without having to learn all these uh, ana anatomical um, landmarks. Let's say, um, let's say uh, the ears. The ears are lateral to the, to the nose. The ears are lateral to the nose because the ears are further away from the midline and the nose is right on the midline. So the ears are lateral to the nose. The nose is uh, medial to the ears. And it, <clears throat> it turns out that the ears are also posterior, right? The ears are also posterior. They're, they're towards the back. So there's two more terms, anterior and posterior. Uh, <clears throat> on, the, on the left, and the left uh, diagram there, you can see the lady, um, we're, we're seeing a side view there, so now we can see forward and backward. So her nose is anterior to her ear, because it's forward, and her ear is posterior to her nose. So it's, it's obviously easier, e easy to see that. Or her, or her, 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 her tummy is anterior to her back. Her back is posterior to the uh, to the tummy. Some people say posterior. You can say whatever you want. Um, when we're talking animals, we can also use uh, dorsal and ventral because what is superior now changes to the back because animals are on their um, you know, on their fours, and so it, it 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 changes. So there's there's two more words that we can use with humans or um, you know with animals. But superior, inferior, anterior, posterior are are good are perfect are definitely enough to describe any type of direction with when it comes to humans. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> and the last. The last, um, the last thing that I need you to know are the three, you know, three or four planes. Three planes. The the first one um, is that we can talk about uh, cuts the body into front and back hat sections, into anterior and posterior sections. So that way you have a, a front half and a back half. That's the it's called the frontal plane. Frontal plane. Another word that you might see, so write this down, is coronal. Coronal comes from the word crown. So if you put a crown on your head, not like a Burger King crown, but like a, a headband crown, that would that would split the body into forward and backward, into front and back halves. <clears throat> coronal and frontal are the same plane. It divides into the your chest and your back, for example. Another one <clears throat> is your uh, tr is our transverse planes, and the transverse planes cut your body into. Um, top and bottom, superior and inferior. So uh, you can take slices across your waist, for example, your chest, and you're dividing the body into slices superiorly and inferiorly. That's that green one that you see, transverse planes. And finally, the last one are your sagittal planes. 
<clears throat> and that's dividing the body into left and right halves. And, and so that's the um, so that's the blue, if if you can see that. And the plane that's right down the middle that divides your body into perfect left and right halves, perfect right down the middle, that's actually called your mid sagittal plane, which is why I, I originally said, you know, three or four planes. But anyway, it's really the same plane. So now if you take that mid sagittal plane and move it over to the left just a little bit and continue to make little slices, you know, or right just a little bit, those are still sagittal planes. It's just not a mid sagittal. It's not going right down the middle, dividing your body into left and right planes. So that concludes <coughs> the handout for body organization. <coughs> and um, we'll see you next time. <coughs>